Welcome to KJV Cafe, where the truths of God's Word come alive. Grab a hot cup of coffee or tea and spend some time learning about our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Listen now to Pastor Clark Covington of Heartland Community Baptist Church as he explores great insights from the Word of God. Have you ever been blind before? Have you ever been made blind? Maybe you couldn't see when you were driving uh, late at night. Maybe someone flashed some brights in your eyes. Maybe uh, you have some form of blindness. Maybe someone said you've been colorblind or maybe you're nearsighted or farsighted. But if you have any experience with blindness, then you'll have a lot of experience uh, with this idea of being blinded to something. And that's what I want to talk about today. That's what I want to make the case about today. The idea of being blinded by lust. And think about it. Who are we in our most natural state? We're sinners. We're prone to sin. Prone to live for ourselves in ways that offends a holy and righteous God. Why do we need laws in this country? Have you ever thought about that? Why do we need government to manage the parks and the public places and the roads? Why do we need prisons and police? Why do we need laws? Why can't we do everything ourselves? Because of sin. In our most natural state, we are sinners. We are prone to sin, prone to live for ourselves in ways that offends a holy, righteous God. And that leads to being blinded by lust. Uh, look at 1 Timothy 1, 15. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, if you have your King James Bible. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception. Exception here is with an A, as in I accept a gift, exception, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Who wrote this verse? The Apostle Paul. Who was he? He's the Apostle to the Gentiles. Oftentimes we call him our Apostle. He's writer of much of the New Testament. A brilliant Christian. He was, if you read about the Apostle Paul, he was highly educated. He was groomed on essentially the Supreme Court. He was equivalent of uh, many uh, doctorate degrees. He was very, very smart. And he, even after uh, the, the encounter with Jesus and his conversion from Saul to Paul. And he was a sinner. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he said, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all exceptions, worthy to accept it, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We, we know that, right? But then Paul adds, of whom I am chief. Paul's calling himself the chief sinner. Can you believe it? Who did he meet on the way to Damascus? Jesus. This is the man that encountered Jesus firsthand, and he tells us he's the chiefest of sinners. See, Paul knows a little bit about something about being blinded, amen? And he tells us he's the chiefest of sinners. If Paul is calling himself the chiefest of sinners, then we can easily assume we are too. I wanted to start this message here today by focusing on this idea that we're sinners so that we won't take the scripture passage that we're going to read today and think we're referring it to someone else. So that's about somebody else. So that's the Old Testament. Oh, this is a different group. Oh, this is for the Israelites. No, we are referring to this as people that it relates to directly. This is a version of ourselves in our most depraved state. And to show, most importantly, that God provided the perfect sacrifice for us, the Holy Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to pay our sin debt and to set us free, the one to save and the one to go to daily for renewing grace and mercy through repentance and prayer. So a lot of people, they look at uh, Jesus and the salvation message as a one-time deal. You accept Jesus, you're saved, and you go about your life. No, 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 no. If I'm honest, I worry about people when they get saved, that they, they'll stay in church, that they'll, they'll continue to grow in the Lord, uh, that they'll depart from sin, or else, uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't, won't even know truly if they're saved, amen? Uh, to be saved is to have a change in you. It's only through the God's grace and the working of the Holy Spirit that convicts you, and you accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, and then once you accept him, he's there for you to go to. 
uh, you know, the Holy Spirit in the Bible is called the comforter, right? He's there for you to go to. He's an advocate with the Father, amen. He's the one that died on the cross for your sins and my sins, amen. We are to go to him daily for renewing grace, mercy, and re- going to him in repentance, true and honest repentance, truly turning from our sins, recognizing them for what they are and not committing them anymore and giving them, uh, asking Jesus for forgiveness each and every day to have a clean spirit about us. Amen. How important is that? So that's our Jesus. Amen. The one that saves and the one that cleanses. Amen. And and now we're going to look a little bit here in Genesis chapter 19 verses one through 11. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a very familiar passage of scripture, and we're going to look and see how this relates to us. Again, that's why I started with Paul mentioning in the New Testament to uh, his epistle to Timothy, first epistle to Timothy, that he's calling himself the chief, chiefest of sinners, and he's given the remedy, Jesus Christ, amen. And that's why I want to do that, that we can relate to this exact thing. Here we go. Genesis 19, 1 through 11. And there came two angels to Sodom at even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. This is verse 1. It's basically saying that two angels were coming to Sodom at the evening time, and Lot was sitting at the gate. That means Lot was a a high-level official. It's kind of like uh, the angels were coming to the courthouse, and, and the judge was sitting at the bench. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. So before the angels had spoken anything, he recognized Uh, dignity and godliness in them, probably a very rare thing to see in Sodom. And he bowed his face to the ground, verse two. And he said, behold, now my lords, turn in, I pray you into your servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And And they said, nay, but we will abide in the street all night. So here in verse two, the angels are saying, we're good. We'll just sleep in the street. And, you know, Lot, he's lived in Sodom. He knows how wicked Sodom is. He does not want these people on the street, these angels on the street. Verse three, and he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and he did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. Verse four, but before they lay down, so this is nighttime. They came at nighttime. They ate, they had a feast. And now here, verse four, they're, you know, it'd be about time they're going to go to bed. But before they lay down here, verse four, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom can pass the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Verse five, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them unto us that we may know them. So the men are surrounded the house and they want to know the, um, the, the men. So the two angels. So if you know, if you look at what that word means in the translation, you look how it's used throughout the Bible, they would like to have sexual relations with the, with the two angels. So you have men desiring other men and they are demanding it here in verse uh, six. And Lot went out the door unto them and shut the door after him. So Lot's kind of leaving the house, getting in front of his house, kind of a hedge between the angels and all those that want to get after him. And verse seven said, I pray you brethren, do not so wickedly. Verse eight, behold, now I have two daughters, which I have, have not known. There's that word known again, have not known man. Let me, I pray you bring them out unto you and ye and do ye to them as it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. So here, verse eight, uh, Lot saying, look, I've got two virgin daughters. Lot is basically prostituting out his daughters to this angry mob. How wicked is this place when that's even taking place, when that's ever a thought in your mind? I've got a daughter and I'll be honest, I'd rather die before prostitute her out. Amen. And here Lot is uh, saying, here's my two daughters. And uh, gosh, what a wicked, wicked place. I believe God allows us. a detail in here to just underline how wicked it is. Verse nine. And they said, this is the mob stand back. And they said, again, this one fellow come came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even lot and came near to the break the door. So verse nine, the mob's getting ready to come in. They're saying to lot, look, you came in here as a journey person. You know, you came in here, you know, you pitched your tent towards here. You moved on in and you were a sojourner. And and now you're, what do you think? You're a judge. You think you're the judge of us? Uh, and I'll get to a point about that in a minute, but verse 10, but the men put forth their hand, this is the angels, and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. Verse 11, and they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. All right, so to wrap that whole section up, the angels bring Lot in. 
Obviously, they are uh, power, have power and commission from God. And you can see that in Genesis 18, where God is talking to Abraham, that's uh, Lot's uncle, and explaining that he was going to go check on Sodom and, and see uh, if they were, was anything good there. Okay, and that's a whole other passage there, but it's kind of a pre, uh, preclude, uh, prelude, I should say, to this here in verse in chapter 19. And here we see the angels, they smote everyone with blindness. And what I want you to think about, which I want you to just take a step back and think about for a minute, okay? Think about this. Why is it that the angels chose to smote them with blindness? I mean, they could have done probably anything to them. And the whole... Uh, city of Sodom and Gomorrah were, would be destroyed the next day. So they could have, uh, you know, killed them or bound them or put them in prison, but they made them blind. I want you to think about this idea, blinded by their lust. And again, don't think about it as a group, this group that you can't relate to. Think about it as you or as I, how we have been blinded by our lust. There's three ideas in particular I want to focus on that deal with the angels of God cursing the men at Sodom's door uh, or at Lot's door, excuse me, in Sodom with blindness. First, I want to look at danger. Then we're going to look at derailment. And finally, we're going to look at destruction. Firstly, the danger of human desire. Think about it. These men literally were blinded by their lust. The men wanted to know the angels. They had great lust in their hearts. They were already committing adultery. Why, how do I know that? Because the Bible says to look upon one with, uh, to look upon another uh, is committing adultery. To so look upon another with lust is committing adultery. Well, these men and this mob of men throughout the city, young and old, as the Bible says, they must have been looking upon these angels with lust because they were asking, where were they? Where are they? We want to see them. They were ready to break the door down. And then here's another question. You know, the danger of human desire. How come nobody stopped them? And this is an epidemic of sin. There was literally no good person left in that place beyond Lot, who again is questionable at this point for trying, for giving, trying to give up his daughters, okay? But there's nobody, there's nobody in that place that's stopping them. Where are the police? Where are the judges? Where are, where, where, where is that good citizen that, where is the, the Samaritan? Where is anybody good there that would say, wait a minute, what are you doing? These people just visited. We don't know them. Why are you trying to do this? The sin had reached epidemic proportions and the men were so determined that danger of human desire, that, that lust left unchecked, it led to sin, great sin. And it had been leading to sin for a long time, as the Bible clearly shows and sets up this picture of this wicked, awful place. And it's not a place that no longer exists. It's simply an example that God gave us out of his generosity, out of his charity, out of his love to say, this is what happens when you let lust get a hold and you let sin go unchecked and you throw God on the back burner and you live as you want in the flesh. This is what happens. It is absolutely insanity, there's no morality, and then it leads to death. James 1, verse 15, very familiar verse, James 1, 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do we not see this here to like an exact replication? James 1, 15, that then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So lust, that's that homosexual desire that the sodomites had, sin, they were, they were obviously sinning because they were lusting on these men, and that, that's a, the sin of adultery, uh, and they were demanding it. Death, well, there was a death to that potential pleasure they had in mind because they became blind. Can you imagine the mob at the door when they become blind, when the angels smote them with blindness? They thought they had Lot completely bowled over. They thought they were going to just charge in there and have their way with everybody, and boom, they're blind. And that idea, like when you're blind, you lose maybe your e equilibrium. If you've ever had vertigo before, if you've ever been dizzy before, gosh, there's almost nothing I hate as much as, as that. I've, I've, I have uh, the allergies, the, the, I think it's like tendonitis or something with the ears ringing, and I, I get lightheaded sometimes. Oh, my Lord. Imagine the, just losing your sense of stability when you go blind and then just wondering when you're going to get your sight back and then the humiliation, having to go home and tell your wife or your kids that you're blind and they ask why and you say, oh, I can't explain it. Amen. Woo, this is so bad. And yet so many live in sin today and they never even think about this. Can you read James and say there is no warning? I don't think you can. 
You're listening to KJV Cafe. As you learn the great truths in God's Word, we encourage you to take the verses mentioned in this episode and study them. Trusting God will open your eyes to a deeper understanding of Himself. Now here's Pastor Clark with the rest of today's message. Okay, so let's just ask the question. You know, did they have an idea, the Sodomites, did they have an idea that uh, there was God, the true God? You know, I think people look at this passage sometimes and they they figure, well, there must be more to this. There must be some reason why the Sodomites were so wicked, or this may be taken out of, out of context or something. But truly, I think what would answer that is if they had evidence of the true God. And I believe uh, you see this in the Bible so clearly when you read Genesis closely and you rightly divide, you see that God commits to Abraham that he wouldn't judge Sodom if there was even 10 righteous in the whole place. Uh, And that he was mentioning to Abraham that he was going to go down there and see. Uh, and, And so you look at this and you wonder, did they have firsthand knowledge of God? And you look at Just a simple Bible timeline, Bible genealogy, very easy to find online. If you look at, you know, Adam and Eve, and they had Cain and Abel, and then they had Seth. Seth, you know, back then they lived a really long time. Seth lived 912 years. So if you can believe it, Seth actually overlaps with Noah for 34 years before Seth died. So Noah knew uh, the, you know, the, the, essentially the fourth created being, right? And then uh, T- Tara, which is at, uh, Abraham and Haran's dad. Haran is the brother of Abraham. And he's the dad of Lot. Okay, so Lot being in Sodom. His dad uh, lived 205 years. And some of those years, over 70 of those years, Abraham was already born. Uh, and so you look at this and you could even look back to um, Lamech, which is uh, Noah's dad. And he was alive uh, at a time when Adam was still alive. And so when you start adding all these things up, again, they lived a long time. I encourage you to go search Bible timelines or, you know, did, did, uh, you know, you can search things like, did Adam know Noah or did, you know, was so-and-so, was Seth alive when Noah was alive or, and so on. You look at these things and what do you see? You see truly that, that these people clearly had firsthand knowledge of God, the creator of Adam and Eve, of the Garden of, of Eden, uh, presumably of the sin curse, amen. They had firsthand knowledge of this. Uh, they had knowledge of all of these things. They had knowledge of the flood, amen. They knew these things that had happened, and yet they still were living in sin. Think of this, has any info been passed on to you by your ancestors, maybe your grandma, your grandpa, of course, Uh, you know, truly, then they knew and they knew better. This means in the generation of Lot, there was just ample firsthand evidence of God, the God we worship and serve today. And if you look at these timelines, you can see that it's crazy that they wouldn't have known the God of Abraham. Amen. They they wouldn't have known the God of Lot. They would have. Uh, And so here we are, they were living unholy. They had no idea who uh, they were pursuing or what the consequences were. You know, sometimes when we live unholy lives, when we live in sin, we have no idea that we're offending God. We have no idea uh, what we're pursuing. The blindness over us is just too great. Uh, and then look at, if you look in verse 9 of, our, of, of the scripture there in Genesis, uh, uh, Genesis 19, verse 9, the, the uh, Sodomites accuse Lot of saying, who, who are you, a judge? You know, what are you going to do? They start, they start basically getting mad at him and angry at him and accusing him of, you know, being self-righteous. Well, guess what? When you live for the Lord and when you're trying to keep the holy things holy, you're going to have the world attacking you, amen. You're going to have the world telling you, are you some kind of judge? You're going to have, you're going to be cast aside, set, set apart. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be knocked down. That's what it's like living for Jesus, amen. Hey, I, I hate to to tell you, but that's the truth. But it's, I don't hate to tell you because in a way it's a blessing because there's a blessing to be uh, persecuted for the Lord. Amen. Many examples in the scripture of the saints of God uh, rejoicing when they were persecuted on behalf of Jesus Christ, our Lord. But what will happen to these wicked people? The persecutors, the ones that go against God, the ones that are blinded by their lust, not just in Sodom, but all that reject the righteousness and reject what the saints of God are are telling them and, and, and giving them the gospel message. What happens to the rejection? God will rightly judge 
all that live in sin and reject his free offer of salvation, we all are going to be at the judgment seat. We will all face judgment. The only question is whether we are judged uh, by believing on Jesus, by claiming Jesus, by saying he's our savior, or are we judged uh, living in sin, uh, rejecting the free offer of salvation, living for ourselves? And then secondly, what do you see here? You see a lack of fear of God. These people obviously did not fear God. Uh, if they did, they would never, ever, ever act like this. We must fear the Lord, not just fear who he is, the creator of everything, omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing, everything, but also we must fear his power. He has that power to destroy. Again, Sodom was an example. He showed his mighty power, and we must fear him, amen? And we must follow his commands, and we have to look at the scripture as a warning to not ignore God. Because you know what? If we do, we are in big trouble. And I've told you about the danger of human desire. But now let's look at the derailment by blindness. You know, the derailment caused by blindness. Who were the angels acting on behalf of? God. So let's assume this is God's judgment. God's angels could have done anything to the men, but chose to blind them. Why? They were blinded in the way to get to God. Have you ever thought about that? All these sodomites are going crazy. They're trying to get to the angels for the wrong reason, but they were blinded and they weren't able to get to them. They were blinded by their own evil deeds. They weren't blinded for no reason. They were blinded because they were lusting. And, and, and that's what we need to understand is that, as James, James points out, you know, it's not a sin to be tempted. Even Jesus was tempted, right? He was tempted by the devil uh, in the desert there. Well, we're, when we're tempted, it's not a sin. What's a sin is when we give in to that temptation and the Bible tells us that we always have a way to overcome it. Uh, if we seek God in prayer, if we get in the scriptures, we can overcome it. But when we give in, when our lust, it conceives into sin, that's when it happens. That's when we end up uh, eating the wages of our, of our sinful fruit, and that is death. Amen. And how does this apply today? When we live in sin and we don't fear God, he turns us over to a reprobate mind. This is something people need to know that, you know, there's people out there that are not convicted by their sin at all. They have no guilt to their sin at all. They enjoy their sin. They're rebellious. They're, they're proud. They're boastful. And these people are going straight to hell. Romans 1, 27 through 32. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, man with men, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Goodness gracious. So we see that what God is doing, as Paul explains here in Romans chapter 1, 27 through 32, what God is doing is at some point you're living in sin, you're living in rebellion to God. He has used his servants to witness to you. He has given you chance after chance and you keep living in sin so flagrantly. God says, fine, have it. You take that sin and you go live with it. And then you see the bitter fruit of this as it unfolds here in Romans 1, 27 through 32, that they, they, they hate God, they're, they're uh, enmity to God, they're at war with God in the ways of God, and they're filled with unrighteousness and fornication and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness, and God just lets them do it, right? And they're haters of God, they're despiteful, they're proud. The Lord hates a proud heart. They're boasters, they're vetters of evil things disobedient to parents, they, they don't have understanding, they're covenant breakers without natural affection. It goes on and on. We have to understand that these folks that are living like this, if they do not get right with God, if, if they are not repentant before a holy and righteous God here now at this time, before he comes back, they will go to hell. They will face the judgment but their ends, their pleasure justifies the means, the sin. And we see this today so much. I think of the drunk driver, that their pleasure, oh, they just want that, that, that feeling, that buzz. They want to just get drunk, forget about all their cares and worries. 
And then the byproduct of that, they get in their car and they're driving home and they hit somebody on the road. Their pleasure, their pleasure led to the death of that person. Or maybe they drive into a telephone pole and kill themselves. Their pleasure led to their own death. And you can see it in drugs and all these other things. The ends never justify the means when it comes to sin, yet that's how so many are living. Those that live in sin today live against God. The Bible word there, enmity, that warfare with God, a holy God that will judge them like he judged Sodom. Remember, Sodom was meant to be an example to all mankind to follow. Don't be blinded by your lust. Don't think that your little bubble of sin is never going to be popped. It's going to be popped and oh, it's going to be a terrible judgment. You should fear the Lord. If you're living in sin today, if you're listening to this and you're living in sin and God allowed you to hear this, amen, I'm telling you now to repent. I'm telling you now, just go ahead. If you're in your car, pull that car over, give it to the Lord right now. Tell him, holy God, please forgive me now. Please forgive me for my sins. I don't want to sin anymore. Give it to God, amen. Do not carry it that burden. Do not live afar off from the Lord. Give him every sin. Turn from it. Do not do it. Hey, you know what that means? That means not, you know, it's called walking with the Lord, right? That's an action step. It is turning physically from it and not doing it. If your sin is pornography, throw the computer in the trash. If it's on the phone, disconnect the phone. Get yourself a flip phone. I, I used to have one. I really like it. If your sin's alcohol, Get out of the beer aisle. Stay away from the bar. Uh, if your sin is is coveting, stop looking in your neighbor's driveway. Stop looking at your neighbor's house. If your sin is uh, greed, uh, then humble yourself. Be grateful for what you have. Give it all to God. Give it all away, man. Realize, you, store your treasures up in heaven. Whatever it is, give it to God while you can, amen. It won't be like that forever because lastly here, there's a day of destruction. The city was burned down in God's judgment the very next day. You think uh, burning a city down is hard for God? You look in a revelation, he burns down uh, the new Babylon in an hour. <laughs> destroys it and people are weeping in an hour. This is nothing too hard for God. This is, it's, it's nothing. I, I was reading today in Genesis about the plagues on Pharaoh and just crazy stuff. And I was trying to imagine these things happening, all the locusts, all the frogs, the lice and all these things. It's, it's just God saying, it's nothing for me. I created everything. I have all power. I can do whatever I want. Amen. He can, he will. And if you need an altar call right now, if you need a wake up call, you look around at the that COVID-19, you look around at political instability, you look around at wars and rumors of wars, you look around at earthquakes and all these things. Lord, have mercy. God has given you enough signs. We are in the end times. It's time to get right with him. Think about it. Those men that wanted to know the angels, what happened to them? Think about their fate. That's what we're supposed to do. They were blinded by lust, right? And we're supposed to look and see, well, what happened to them? They were living in sin. What happened to them? That's what God wants us to do. Ask that question. What happened to those men? What happened to the people in Sodom and Gomorrah? They died. There was no remedy. Second Chronicles 36, 16. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Ooh, no remedy. Okay? That means no. there's no fixing it. It's too late. No way to fix it. No going back. Nothing more to do. If you pick a fight with a human by not living by their rules, what's the worst they can do to you? But pick a fight with God by ignoring his will and living in sin, and he can and will cast you into hell. Hell is a real place. It's, this is a fate worse than death. It's called the second death. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are we looking to please man or God in this world? One leads to destruction and the other to life. Truly, the Bible says, if you're not for me, you're against me. We must be for God. We must live for God. The time is near. We're in the very last days. What are we going to do for God today? Let's get right with him. Amen. I wish I had more time. I don't, but I can tell you right now, being blinded by lust is a real thing. The wages of sin is death. It's a real thing. We need to get right with God. We need to walk humbly with God. We need to be truly sold out to God. And we need to understand ourselves as sinful creatures and get in line, bring every thought uh, to Christ, put every thought under consideration to Christ, give it all to Christ. And when we live for the Lord, not only will our lives be full of peace and love and no one will be perfect, 
but we will have that peace that surpasses all understanding. We'll have that Holy Spirit not grieved within us, but dwelling within us greatly. And for that, the price is worth it. Get right with God today and stay on the firing line. Amen. Thanks for visiting the cafe today. 